One of the perks of keeping chickens is letting them be, well, chickens. Chickens are beautiful, active, typically peaceful birds, and having them meander through the background of your homestead is a special sort of pleasure that I really wish more people knew. The more time you spend with them, the more you'll get used to their predictable daily schedule. To me, this lesson is kind of a funny one. Before you have chickens, getting to imagine this animal-born rhythm in the background of your world is an exciting dream of another step towards self-sufficiency. But after you've had chickens for a few seasons, you may laugh that this could even be lesson material. So take that as a future encouragement that this animal clock could someday become just an inherent part of the everyday, just like the knowledge and experience you've gained along the way. So that said, let's talk about typical chicken behavior. So like any wild bird, chickens are also controlled by daylight. They are designed to start moving around and looking for food as soon as the sun gives them the ability to see. So as soon as the light starts to fade, that's their cue to find a safe, high spot to roost for the night. Because once chickens have roosted and fallen asleep, they basically turn off. Though they may react with a few sounds if poked or move their head around, they're basically completely prone. So much so that if you have an aggressive rooster or a flighty bird that hates being handled, all you need to do is save your maintenance with them until after dark. They'll be much more like putty in your hands. This is also why they're so vulnerable to predators after dark. When they're off, they don't really even try to get away from a threat. I had a neighbor once lose a bunch of hens because a raccoon just reached through the chicken wire of their coop and grabbed handfuls of chicken meat until he'd eaten his fill. The one inexplicable exception that I have experienced to this predictable on-off with the daylight is my rooster. Maybe my rooster is just a weirdo, but there are occasions where I'll hear him crowing at bizarre hours of the night. Midnight, 2 a.m., 4.30, well before the sun comes up. I'm really not sure what he's trying to accomplish or if that's just how roosters dream, but it's something to keep in mind if you decide to keep the coop close to your bedroom wall. This is the only real instance I know where a chicken makes noise that might annoy the neighbors. If the neighbors are within close hearing distance of your coop, anyway. Now, during the course of the daylight hours, there's two main activities that a busy flock always does. The main goal, of course, is to eat and drink. And as soon as they're out of the coop for the morning, the chickens will be immediately at work, scratching the ground for bugs and worms and seeds and circling the water pan. But once they have a nicely full crop in the afternoon, they have time for more leisurely pursuits, such as the all-important preening and dust bathing. I sometimes find my whole flock scratching a hollow in the ground and then having what looks like a communal dust bath with their wings and their legs flailing everywhere. It looks ridiculous. So if your bird's free range, they may scratch bare hollows in the ground to dust bathe. If your goal is to have a perfect lawn, they will take great pains and pleasure in frustrating your efforts. But if you don't mind the occasional bare spot, you can enjoy the funny sight of a bird flopping around on the ground like a little dust storm. Dust baths are important for helping chickens keep their skin in prime condition. The dust helps choke away any lice or mites, and it also helps them cool down in the hottest parts of the summer. And preening their feathers into order is not just vanity. Using the oil from the oil gland at the base of the tail conditions the feathers. Well-conditioned and order feathers are signs of a healthy bird, and they help keep her warm and dry. You will become surprisingly adept at speaking chicken after spending a year or so with your birds. These social animals employ more than 30 different specific vocalizations with each other. So here's a handful of the sounds that they make and what they might mean. A content chicken scratching the leaf letter will often quietly mutter to herself. This is my favorite of their sounds, and the one you will hopefully hear the most often. Just a soft little exploratory click that means she's happy and content. Now when a hen lays an egg, she'll sing what some people call the egg song. This is a hen at her daily loudest, punctuating a long, low-pitched clucking with an explosive bukak! If you also have a rooster, he'll usually join in the song as well. My best guess is that this translates to, we did it, we have procreated, long live our genetic line, or something like that. Hen's alarm call is rather similar to her egg song, but rather than being a joyful declaration of egg laying, it's a serious warning that something bad is close. Usually the top hen and the rooster will give simultaneous alarm calls and the rest of the flock will be on super flighty high alert. If you hear that bagok and you see all the hens either running away or flying crazy around the coop, something's not right and you should really check it out fast. This sound will alert you to threats like stray dogs marauding the homestead, egg-eating rat snakes among the nesting boxes, or a hawk attack.
A broody hen has a bunch of extra sounds that non-broody hens never make. She'll scream in distress at anyone who approaches her clutch, often getting the rooster to growl in warning as well, and has a totally separate set of sweet little clucking communications that she'll use with her chicks. As the self-declared guardian of the flock, a rooster has lots of extra sounds that they use to communicate to the flock as a whole. When a rooster finds food, for example, especially in the spring and summer when he is paying special attention to his ladies, he'll call them over with a sort of tuk 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 call. This basically translates to, I found something tasty, come eat it. Roosters will also make a sound whenever they see something welcome or benign. Usually you'll hear this sound when he catches sight of you emerging around the corner with a bucket of feed. I imagine his chuckling cluck 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 translates to, yay, the food thing. Some roosters also make what sounds, to me anyway, like a dinosaur growl. Your rooster may sound different, but basically this is a sound in a series of communications used to tell the flock, I don't quite know what that is. Stay on your guard. Next in that warning series is a rooster's attention call. I have often heard this one triggered when a large bird is flying close overhead, a clear threat to a scratching flock, even in, if in many cases it's really just a flying duck. It is loud and meant to get the hens to stop what they're doing and look to him for protection. Final in this warning series, however, is a rooster's alarm call. It's lower in pitch, but similar to a hen's alarm call. And this explosive series of bagarks is his most severe cry of something bad, let's get away. Of course, there's nothing more iconic than the sound of a rooster crowing over a farmyard. Every rooster's crow is individual. Some are long, some are short, some are loud, some are extended. You'll find out when you get your own rooster. He will crow most in the spring and in the summer, and may be essentially silent in the winter. The crow of a rooster means many things, but all of them are the rooster trying to assert himself. When your proud rooster crows, he's saying, I am loud, I am strong, this is my place, these are my hens, their eggs are my babies, and so on. If your neighbor has a rooster within earshot, he may even have a crow off with your rooster at any point of the day. That they usually can't get to each other to physically spar, they're still declaring their territory, much like a male robin singing at dawn. Even chicks have their own set of specific sounds. Probably the most important two to know as a new chicken keeper are the normal peep and the distressed peep. Happy, healthy, warm chicks will run around making bright little cheeping sounds that have a relatively consistent pitch. However, a chick that is cold, sick, being stepped on or feeling threatened will make a much louder peep that descends in pitch. You may remember from the first lesson that wild jungle fowl are social birds that have a pecking order to keep everyone in line. Domesticated chickens still retain those social instincts, and once your new birds have settled into their home at your place, or once your chicks have reached adulthood, the pecking order will emerge. If there's a single rooster, his huge intimidating size will usually immediately place him at the head of the flock. In the wild, hens would naturally be collected into a flock by the biggest and strongest male. They know that the bigger the rooster, the better their chance of having strong offspring, protection from predators, and defense from rivals. The rooster will often position himself so that his head is higher than any other birds. He's always watching for any possible threat against his beloved hens. His vertically held tail, upright posture, and brazen crowing are all signals that a rooster uses to say, I'm the leader. Listen to me and be safe. Cross me and you'll be sorry. Keeping multiple adult roosters in confinement, therefore, may lead to a spur-flourishing bloodbath, especially if they're similar in size and strength. There can be only one at the top, in their minds. I strongly exhort you, especially for the beginner, to keep only one rooster at a time. If you raise chicks and end up with multiple males, you'll need to pick one to keep and either trade or eat the others. No matter how attached you are to these birds after raising them, it is short-sighted to house more than one rooster in close artificial proximity. And as a safety note, before I, we move on, I should mention human safety around roosters as well. Many roosters respect humans for being so much bigger than them and for providing nice things like food. As long as a rooster doesn't see you as a threat, they aren't a problem. But remember, roosters often use their spurs for defense and for establishing pecking order. So if the big guy feels threatened by you, he is much more likely to lash out with those fearsome spikes. Some keepers make a daily habit of catching and petting the roosters just to keep relations friendly. I personally don't cuddle with my rooster, but I do talk to him and make a point to calmly move in and out of his personal space every day. Also, don't let your pets, kids, or your friends' kids tease your birds. They may think it's fun to chase a rooster, but all they're doing is preconditioning him to be permanently nasty and spur-happy. Finally, 
Don't act afraid around your rooster. I really do believe that they can sense it. Just go about your chicken business with kindness, confidence, and a watchful eye, and everything should be fine. Rooster body language, then, is really important to understand, because no matter how calm your rooster seems, you need to always be aware of where he is and how he's responding to your presence, particularly if he's a brand new rooster. If he's happy and content, he really will take no notice of you. He'll be far more busy making sure that his hens are in order. But when a rooster spends a long time looking at you, it's because he's not entirely comfortable. The term cockeyed actually comes from a rather apt description of a rooster's habit of inspecting a potential threat. If a rooster is uneasy about you, he might move towards you sideways, his head down as if he were looking at something in the grass, but he's really studying you. If he rushes and bumps into your leg, he is showing aggression, and you need to not take it lightly. If he starts fluffing up his feathers, particularly the long hackle feathers around his neck, then he's getting ready to attack. Now don't get nervous about this. I personally have never even had my rooster get to this point, and you may never see that either. A lot of it depends on breed, individual temperament, and environment. But just in case you end up with a particularly nasty rooster, now you know at least a little bit about what to watch for. And my advice? Nasty roosters are not worth the risk on the homestead. There's plenty more good roosters out there who don't want to hurt you. Send an overly aggressive rooster to the freezer and get one who's much happy to be with you and keep your children safe instead. Anyway, let's get back to the pecking order in your flock. The next chicken on the social ladder is usually the biggest hen. She also holds her tail relatively high. She'll back the rooster up when he gives a warning call and will be the most dominant bird at the feeder. She might even be his favorite to mate with. All the rest of the flocks fall somewhere underneath them. Knowing exactly where each individual falls in the pecking order really doesn't matter. Usually the rest of the lower ranking birds hold their tails a little bit less erect. In a small flock, you may be even able to figure out who holds the lowest spot. She's usually the smallest and runs around trying to avoid getting in everybody else's way. An established pecking order is usually a very peaceful arrangement. There may be the odd squabble or two about something particularly tasty, but by and large, when birds know their place and are given what they need, they are content. This is something very important to keep in mind when you're bringing new chickens into the flock. If you already have an established pecking order, even if it's only three hens, a newcomer will need to be jostled into that order somehow. And the truth is, chickens never really do it politely. It is called a pecking order, after all. The first time you introduce a new bird to a flock, after a two-week quarantine period, more on that later, expect feathers to fly. Though it may look like a horrible hazing ritual from some sort of fraternity, re-establishing the pecking order is a natural process. Remember, your birds aren't humans, and they really don't care about making sure that newcomers feel welcome and loved. They'll chase around a new bird, rip out her feathers, peck at her head, and generally be what seems to us quite cruel. The new bird will spend most of her first week running away and hiding and looking scared. You can temper this acceptance process for the new bird by giving her her best possible chance. Prime targets for abuse are small birds, so make sure that any new birds are roughly the same size as the established flock. This means any new chicks that you raise need to be fully feathered out and nearly their adult size before they start to roost with the big birds. Introducing new birds during the night off time also has seemed to be a more peaceful transition, at least in our flock. We put new birds into the coop at night when the established flock has already roosted. Even though the new ones may crouch confused in the corner for a night or two, the old birds will wake up with these new ones in their coop like they'd always been there, which seems to keep them from ganging up on them immediately. During the transition time, also make sure there are escape places for new birds if they're confined in a closed coop and run. A new bird may spend a lot of time cowering in a bucket or in the corner of the nesting area, but at least it gives them a place to escape the pecking and feather pulling. If there's enough space for all the other birds to still go about their business after administering their punishments, and if the newcomer has a place of refuge in the meantime, the newness will fall off a little bit more smoothly. I also provide two separate food and water pans during the transition time. Old birds won't tolerate new ones messing around with their food at first, and in confinement, this may mean that your new birds don't get much to eat at first. In our coop setup, I put food and water in the run, where the old birds are used to it, and also in the coop, where the new birds hide until they're accepted. While most pecking establishment looks much worse than it really is, you do need to keep a sharp eye out for blood during the transition time. This is really the only time you need to intervene. If a particularly vengeful old bird makes a new one bleed, take it out as soon as you can and let it heal before trying to introduce it again. Once chickens see blood, they peck at it incessantly. Now after about a week or two, things will go back to normal and all the birds will know their place again and the homestead will breathe a collective sigh of relief. I hope this window into chicken behavior helps you understand your birds better once you introduce them to your world. 
I knew none of this when I started, but after just a few years of watching my flock and learning from them, the sight and the sound of the flock can tell me how they're doing and if anything is amiss. I really value getting to rediscover this natural way of observing and understanding that all people used to have when the majority of our ancient lives are spent outside and among animals.